Your presence graces the air, and soon everyone will see. Hi, you, Maud. Yes, hi. It takes nothing special to mop up after the dying. You're prettier than the last one. But to save a soul, that's quite something. Bless Amanda's body and bless her mind, which is shrouded in darkness. When you pray, do you get a response? Oh, it's like he's physically in me. It's how he guides me. My little savior. I turn to ignore you. Don't say I didn't want you. You must be the loneliest girl I've ever seen. I'm ready and open. I feel fuller of your love than ever before. I have a responsibility. Oh yes, of course. This is life and death on another level. If I'm getting it all wrong. All the good girls go to hell. Rose Glass is the writer and director of Saint Maud, a cracking horror movie that's on release on the first of February. It's actually Mark Kermode's film of the year last year. It tells the story of Maud, who's a reclusive young nurse. She's a kind of really devoted, born again Christian who's put in charge of the hospice care of a, a retired dancer who's suffering with cancer. Maud sees her as this, you know, soul that's about to enter eternal damnation and makes it her quest to save her. If you, you know, know, know anything about horror movies and religion, this doesn't go particularly well. It reminded me a lot of Taxi Driver, that kind of concept of God's lonely man or woman, to, you know, quote another great religious film there, Life of Brian, about someone who finds this one obsessive task and just kind of builds their life around this singular vision to complete it at all costs. I really, really enjoyed this. It's it's one you really need to focus on, though. It's not like, you know, like a paranormal activity or so, or there's kind of jump scares every few minutes. It's not something you can half watch. There's so many little subtle moments where, you know, did, did I actually see that happen or have I put that into my own head? But it does reward you as it go on. Like I can see a lot of people, if you're kind of half watching this with your phone, going, well, it wasn't scary. Well, if you didn't buy into it, it's not going to build to it. So it's definitely one for, you know, horror aficionados as opposed to people who like, you know, the roller coaster, jump scares every few minutes. One thing I absolutely love about it, it has an ending. Now, I know that's a stupid thing to say, but horror movies especially have that tendency to cop out with the oh it was all a dream or the hand from the grave or you know the laziest of all it, it's whatever you want it to be no this has a start middle and an end and I, I really really like that um i got to talk to the director rose glass about the film uh she was talking about kind of the the difficulty of releasing during covid when she had all this you know festival buzz people like danny boyle mark herman obviously champion in the film and she also talks to me about watching the sex scenes with her grandparents. So that was a nice, fun little twist I wasn't expecting. So here's my interview at Rose Glass. Hope you enjoy it. First of all, absolutely love the film. Uh, it's actually the last film I've gotten to see in a cinema and the only horror one I've gotten to see uh, last year. Oh, nice. So you managed to catch it in the cinema. Yeah, Thanks. and it was a very different experience. Um, obviously, you've been a first-time writer-director. You've gone through you know, the difficult process of getting your film made and getting it out there. What's it like having kind of the, the main form of distribution essentially pulled out from under you just at, at release time? Um, at, the, at the time, it was mad. It, I mean, on so many levels, because obviously just quite apart from the film, just what was happening in the world anyway was sort of, you know, um, sort of incomprehensible and surreal. And the fact that it seemed to coincide quite so perfectly with the release of our film, which we which they'd been, you know, initially it was about to get released in America and the UK last spring. And everyone it was going to have this wide release and everyone was like, this never happens to a debut UK film. Oh, my God. We had to fly out there and then it was like travel ban. It's like, great. Um, so I think probably maybe a week or so of feeling sort of um, sorry, sorry for ourselves and, and sort of offend, um, annoyed, but very quickly it all pales into insignificance. And it's been quite a nice distraction from everything, to be honest, every now and then having it sort of, we're spreading it out, I guess. The reason that's mentioned. release fun. <laughs> The reason I was mentioning watching it with uh, an audience is, apart from the, the obvious scene, the one that got the biggest reaction in the screening I was in is the scene with the towel falling 
and the reveal then of what was in the towel. And it's just it being embedded into my head is the woman sitting a few rows in front of you just shouting, Jesus Christ, at the top of her voice. <laughs> Hang on, dropping the towel? Yeah, the, the scene where just the, the towel falls in the background of Maud and then reveals that the, the crucifix is in the towel got a massive reaction in the oh, screen. Oh, right, yeah. Really? And there's so much of this film that demands your attention. And had you known that the release was going to be changed, is there any scenes you would have made, even as far back as the writing process, that you would have changed aspects to kind of cater for home as opposed to a cinema audience? Oh, God, I'd like to think, I don't think I have that level of kind of control over stuff as we're <laughs> shooting at what's going to work best in cinema and at home. I, I don't know. I mean, you try, you know, you sort of fantasize about everything ending up on the cinema screen. So we tried to sort of always uh, make it as kind of cinematic as possible and immersive. I mean, it's, yeah, it has definitely been surprising seeing which bits audiences respond to. I think the um, like things like the bit where she puts pins in her shoes, that sort of just become like a very regular part of the film to all of us shooting it. You sort of become a bit desensitised. And then seeing it with a sit audience for the first time at our premiere, premiere it was like, oh. I actually have a pair of Converse I can't wear now because every time <laughs> I look at them, I just see oh, good, that going yeah. into it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. The casting for the character of Maud is obviously very important. If you get that wrong, this character could be, and, and not this down, this like, could be Kathy Bates in yeah, Misery, yeah. a kind of a cartoon version of that. But you end up having a, yeah. a great degree of sympathy for the character. What did you see in Martha Clark that maybe others didn't have or others didn't bring to that process um I mean I do love Kathy Bates and Misery I have to say that but um, <laughs> I guess the film's not from her perspective but but more of it she I mean like she I don't know it's hard to sort of pin down because I guess it's that sort of irritatingly sort of abstract thing we needed somebody who you can sort of not take your eyes off for an hour and a half because you know she sort of has to carry the film and I guess it needs, needs I, I think she sort of, she felt like somebody that one, we sort of, you just really want to watch. I just find her a very sort of fascinating, funny performer. Um, but, she, you know, the character goes to a lot of quite strange places and does some really morally reprehensibly, morally reprehensible and awful things. Um, but we sort of wanted the audience to kind of still primarily be sort of rooting for her and with her the whole way and sort of find her sympathetic. So that's quite a lot to, um, anyway, somehow we thought more, we thought more of it encapsulated all that. Um, and she, I don't know, she's just got this quite strange, haunting, otherworldly quality, but then we'll turn around and just be really dry and funny and we were not expecting it. I don't know, she's, she's, she's brilliant. And of course now she's been cast in the, the Lord of the Rings TV show and you've given her the, I know. Uh, the, the boost with that with, with, uh, with speaking Welsh, which is what Elfish is based on. I know. <laughs> and she looks great in a robe. But it's, we showcased that in St. Maud. So yeah, I take full credit for that. <laughs> but I was, <laughs> I was a massive Lord of the Rings fan as a teenager. They were one of the first films I got really obsessed with. So when she told me about it, I sort of completely lost my mind. And then I had, in every interview I've been doing recently, I've been like, and now she's in Lord of the Rings. Can you believe it? And then somebody told me, they're like, well, the publicist says maybe don't talk about all of that too much. <laughs> but you brought it up, so it's fine. But, and they're looking for directors for a few episodes. <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a scene at the, near the start where we see Maud has a, a Mary Magdalene chain and you know initially your mind goes yeah. to you know, Mary Magdalene the prostitute but if you're a former altar boy like me you know like she was there during Jesus suffering the crucifixion and the resurrection but then you have Maud say oh I got it online is that your way of you yeah. know people tend to like read a lot especially in the horror movies of you know what does this mean and that mean is that your way of saying look take what this take from this what you want <laughs> a little bit yeah I had that's a nicer way of putting it. I, yeah, I think, I, I mean, I know, obviously, yeah, there's, you know, some obvious parallels between the idea of like Mary Magdalene is like this fallen woman who's sort of also very close to Jesus. But yeah, as you were saying, she's kind of more commonly mis, mis, um, what's the word? Misrepresented. Anyway, as a sort of prostitute. But anyway, she's lots, not more complex than that. But um, yeah, I figured more of it is, not more of it, God, more of someone who kind of has invented her own weird version of Christianity and is very much pick and choosing the bits that she follows and adheres to. I didn't think that she was some, you know, she's not somebody who had grown up going to church as, as, as sounds like you and me did. And she, I, yeah, for me, she's not a character who's kind of immersed in the details and sort of mythology and Bible stories. And there's a lot she doesn't know. I think she's kind of winging it um, and kind of going with what feels good, which was helpful because it meant that I could do very little research. <laughs> uh, transformation is obviously a key part of the film you have Maud reading through the books of William Blake which anyone any horror fan or any mm. fan of Manhunter knows that doesn't tend to end well <laughs> did you have a, a personal view on Maud or a personal take on Maud's conversion for 
me, and I'm sure this is exactly what you wanted. My brother is a recent convert to veganism. And since yeah. then, he's, you know, this is the only way to live. We all need to do this, even though two weeks ago he was yeah. eating Big Macs. I was wondering, is there <laughs> anything you were inspired by in particular, or anything from your own life that you were drawn upon for that aspect of Maud's character? Um, on, only in so much as I personally had the opposite experience, I guess, of being very much brought up with Christianity around and it being very familiar, maybe because of that sort of being fairly happy to sort of separate myself from it. And the only friends that I'd had growing up who had been sort of quite, and that, it, that seemed sort of the same across the majority of people I was at school with at this Catholic school. I don't remember many people being devoutly religious. The only really, really religious friends I had growing up was one, a couple of different people. And they would both happen to be people who sort of found Christianity later in life and sort of as a response to something else um, happening to them. So, and that made sense to me that something that you sort of discover for yourself when you're a bit older, maybe you'd cling to that bit more, or it feels like it's maybe more yours and more individual. So, I don't know. I mean, her, I mean, obviously in, in this particular case, in this film, her, it's also all wrapped up in the fact that she seems to be kind of suffering from some kind of delusions as well. So it's not sort of just um, just a regular case of her discovering faith, I guess. But um, yeah, that seemed like more interesting territory to me than, I think in some early drafts I had all these sort of cheesy flashbacks of her going to some weird Catholic school with nuns everywhere. But um, I'd done that and actually all the nuns have been very um, terrifying and lovely. So... <laughs> It, it felt, it felt a bit of an way. obligation to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, finally, your previous short, Room 55, dealt with uh, a TV chef. She finds herself next to some kinky goings on. So we say the film oh, has I a rope that. coordinator, just to give you an example of that. <laughs> Saint Maud has a few risque scenes itself. Is it true your granny yeah. has watched both of these with you? <laughs> uh, yeah, she has. Yeah, they, What's that um, like? <laughs> Well, I mean, luckily, I sort of I think I was a few seats away from her each time. And luckily, the nice thing about being in a cinema, obviously, you don't have to talk whilst it's happening. So I think she'd just talk about other bits afterwards. <laughs> so I think she came up to me after this. She, I think I brought her along to the to the London Film Festival screening. And she sort of came out and was like, where on earth did that come from? <laughs> um, my granddad actually came to see the Room 55, that short film as well. And yeah, there's a scene towards the end where the main character gets tied up in Japanese rope bondage and my granddad came out and he was kind of like oh I love the bit with the ropes wonderful great so it's all very classily done um so yeah so uh, you, you didn't lick it off They're a stone as they say <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. thanks so much I really appreciate talking today I absolutely love the oh, film nice to thanks talk a lot to you. have a thanks good day so much.